Hi, this is going to be a quick uh, demo tutorial thing just to show how I produce some of my stylized materials. Um, this is just like a practice piece I did earlier, but you'll probably recognize the style from some of my other substance designer materials. And I'm doing this due to uh, popular demand. There are a few people that wanted to know how I did it and help improve their skills in producing stylized materials. And I just thought I'll do a quick video to basically just go through that process and underline everything and just show briefly uh, how I managed to produce those effects. Now it is all very elementary, it's quite straightforward. Um, I am going to assume you have at least a small amount of designer knowledge. Uh, otherwise, just watch the uh, logarithmic sort of like base uh, tutorials for designer. They're very good. Uh, they produce like this metal grated um, material and it's a very, very, very simple uh, tutorial, but it'll get you up to, up to speed. But I'm not going to assume much knowledge uh, for this tutorial. It's going to be quite simple. And I've set up a separate project, so this is the sort of the kind of material we're going to be making, uh, but it's more based on the principles of using um, stylized kind of like techniques in order to create the material that you want. So you could realistically create um, bark, like tree bark, wooden planks, uh, gravel, grass, you know, all, all of that sort of stuff just with the exact same technique that I'm going to show you now, pretty much. It's all very similar. Now, this is going to be my base project. I've kind of done a little bit of setup, so we're not going to be using roughness or metallic. I don't think they're important um, to achieve this sort of style. However, there probably are a lot of stylized materials that uh, do use those, and you probably will want to. Um, I know that I use these in the actual game engines, like Unreal Engine, so I set those up in there. So like when it rains, I increase the reflectivity and things like that, uh, just to... <clears throat> just to make the most of those, but otherwise I've just set it to kind of like a dark grey and a light grey, just so we've got this pretty, you know, standard looking cube. Um, ambient occlusion, it's just kind of like this little mid-grey thing at the moment. That's just the levels node with the black set fairly high, just so it's not too, you know, overbearing. But other than that, I think that's pretty much the setup, and we can get into it. Now, my technique for this is you should always have reference as well. I'm going to go through uh, based off a previous bit of reference that I use, but always take a piece of reference. So I think there's a common misconception that stylized materials are just easier to make than realistic materials, but I would personally disagree. I think stylized materials require uh, knowledge of how to make realistic stuff first because it still uses the same underlying principles uh, to create them. So you do need that level of understanding. Um, how to utilize forms and how to produce them, that sort of stuff. And as long as you have some basic knowledge, I think that's important and that's fine. And you'd probably be able to be on, uh, get on your way. Uh, but the reason I say that's important is because what I tend to do when I create stylized materials is I look at something realistic and I exaggerate its forms, but I still use it as reference. Um, so you kind of like, in order for something to look believable, it still has to um, utilize some essence of reality, something that makes sense. Uh, otherwise, it just looks strange or it doesn't seem believable enough or, it, you know, it's a bit unusual. Uh, so with that out of the way, I suppose we can really get started. And my technique is to start with the largest forms first and work my way down. I don't even think about color. And even if I was using roughness and metallic, I wouldn't think about that until the end. The very first thing is getting shapes that you're happy with and establishing a strong foundation. That includes normal maps, height maps, and ambient occlusion. So they both, they all contribute to essentially the same thing, which is creating a believable uh, illusionary geometry, essentially. So to get into that, we're going to start with the biggest possible forms, which is going to be uh, the rock face. So uh, thinking of like the massive crevices, I think a cells modifier is going to help us out a lot there. So you can grab that from the library. I'm going to set the scale quite low because these are the sizes that I want my rocks. Now, that doesn't really look like information we can use yet, which is why I use an edge detect node in order to grab the, the edges of it. This is such an important node. I use it all the time. It's really, really, really useful um, for capturing the information that you want. Now, it's got lots of really interesting um, options in here. This is why I prefer using cells 4 with edge instead of, like, say, cells 3. Because, it actually, it's quite limiting. You can't, like, change the uh, the thickness of, like, the lines really easily. So, it's a bit of, um, it's a bit annoying. So, instead, I use this. Now, I'm going to take the edge around this down, which is going to be really, really simple to start with. And we'll give it, you know, some some gaps in between. And now we're going to be using a really, really fantastic tool. It's called the Flood Fill Modifier. It's actually quite recent in terms of designer's lifetime. Um, but we can plug that in there. What it's actually going to do is, as you've probably guessed, it's going to take the islands out. Or it's going to highlight the islands in the, um, in the material. You know, it even works kind of similar 
for this, but you might see that it's a bit strange because there's no outlines to follow. So that's what it's looking for, is it's looking for like an outline. Um, so it's not going to work brilliantly with that, but thanks to Edge Detect it's going to highlight the information better. So Floodfill node does nothing on its own, really. It's um, It just possesses a lot of data. So if we do it again, these are all the expanded options that we can add. So you can actually do things like give it a random color, which is awesome um, and quite useful, but not necessarily for this. We're going to be using gradient one. So if I um, well before we do that, let's let's quickly um show what this is doing here. So I'm going to actually make a levels node and plug that in, just so we can see what's going on. There we go. So it's created like these horrible sharp grainy drops in the um, uh, in the material. And in fact, I realized that I've forgotten to do something, which is to set this up with tessellation. So if you go into materials, default, definitions, physically metallic roughness default, uh, tessellation. And you might need to change the scale, but this is so much better than using um, the just parallax occlusion, because that's all an illusion. I mean, that is a more realistic representation of how it will look in engine. Uh, but this is much easier to work with. You can really highlight your forms a lot better. And it looks horrible with this grain. So um, here's a really general tip. If you blur your height map, it will create these much, much nicer drops. So if you look at that, um, in fact, let's um, go back to our setup and increase the resolution of our tessellation to like 10. Doesn't need to be massive. But look at that. That is buttery smooth now. And we will use that. It is quite an important technique. Uh, blurring a height map does not necessarily sacrifice detail. Um, it can if you ramp it too high, but sometimes it actually um, collects detail and um, or more accurately displays it in a more satisfying manner. So keep that in mind. It is really useful. Uh, but up to until then, uh, we're going to be still focusing on this. So what happens is if um, we get the flood fill and we plug it into this gradient, it's going to create these wacky sort of like gradient patterns. In fact, if we plug that in, that's how it's going to look. And it looks absolutely awesome. So I am going to keep this blur here just so we can better see the results and just set it really low. Yeah, there we go. So that already looks like something quite cool, something you could use. And quite often I find um, information that I want to try out when I use designer, like just done on a different material. And I'm like, ah, you know, that'll make a good material. Uh, so that's the first step. But actually, you know, there's a lot more we need to do. Uh, first off, I'm actually going to set a lot of angle variation because this is going to make it look a bit less uniform. Um, not too high. But um, yeah, it's going to give us some interesting, like, shapes, more noise almost. And um, now we're just going to copy it. And then it should stay rooted, it should m maintain the same effects, but we're actually going to change it so it's like north facing. Then we're going to do the same again. Make this one so the angle is east. Do it again. Make it so this angle is somewhat south. Now we've actually all got these different angles uh, showing up. So what we can do is blend them together with this. Um, blend is a very important node. <coughs> Alright, blend them together like that. And if we apply the darken modifier in the drop down here, it's actually going to sort of combine them. And look, we've got this you know, part of the um, you know, the slope from the other node. Now, I'm sure you can guess where we're going to go with this next. And we're going to take this blend modifier again. Link up to these two instead. And last but not least, we're going to form like a hierarchy. Combine them all. And look, it's given us these um, these really interesting shapes. However, I'm noticing a bit of an issue. And that's that these all kind of like meet in a really unnatural point in the middle. In fact, I just want to check the angles on all of these. Oh, yeah. Are those the same? Hmm. Yeah, okay. So I've made a bit of an error there. This one needs to be somewhere else. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so that needs to be easy. Make sure you've got one for like north, east, west, and south. Otherwise, it's just overlapping. Um, yeah, it just doesn't look right, does it? They all meet right in the middle. And the way you can fix that is by changing the bounding box size. And what that literally does is it, um, the bounding box is around each island with the flood fill modifier. Uh, but you can actually grow that square, and it makes the, um, it makes the gradient less prominent. 
uh, which causes the whole um, direction to shift across the stone. And if you have each one on a slightly different bounding box size, never have them the same, but have them all sort of slightly different, um, they'll all kind of like yield a slightly different result. You can also you know, change the variation more as well to get some more interesting shapes. There's just a lot of experimentation. Um, okay, yeah, let's make this one quite high. Now that's starting to look a bit better. However, it's all gone really flat. We've lost a lot of detail, and it's because this is so dark. The way we can recapture the detail is with the levels node. This grey area here has no height data in it. It's all like kind of like not in use, so if we simply drag the range back, it's going to collect it all again. And we can start to see that this um, shape is really starting to come into fruition. I'd like to uh, mess with the seeds a bit just to make sure it looks good um, in general, because a terrible mistake you can make is never change the random seeds of any of the modules you're working with, because then what happens is... Um, you might be making material that looks great for a very specific set of random options. However, if you try to change it, uh, which is one of the beautiful things about Substance Designer, you can just get crap, 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 and, and it's just like, it sucks because you made it for this one niche. Uh, so always be changing that. And I'm actually going to change the rock size because I think it's, these forms are a bit large, uh, small for what I want. Um, let's maybe settle for four. Yeah. Oh, that looks great. Cool. Okay, so that's what I want. I'm still noticing I've got this, these strange points here, so I'm actually going to go back to uh, messing around. Again, you know, this is why it's important. This is um, why I checked, because now I know that it's not perfect. And uh, it's actually a bit of a missed opportunity. Okay. Okay, that's starting to look better. So um, you definitely wouldn't want to get to the end of the project and realize that problem right at the end. Because it looked okay on the random set we had before, but it definitely didn't look good with that one. So it's a good thing we checked. Okay, cool. That's still good. we still got all the detail. And um, we've highlighted our largest forms now, which is kind of like the rock face. So the next step is going to be... Um, yeah, like these kind of like edges here. Like So if we take, take down this, um, this blur... Like, look at how, like, beautifully sharp these are. Yeah, you know, that's the kind of detail we want to preserve, really. Um, but it looks horrible on the sides here. So I'm going to attempt to get the best of both worlds. And we can do this with the um, this edge detect thingy. <laughs> so if we blend, we're going to take the main thing. So we're going to pop that in the middle. That's our main, um, the main sort of structure. We also want that blurred structure as well. Just for the edges of the stone. I'm going to plug that in here. And we're going to set it to switch. So if I um, go ahead and plug this into the end one here. We're going to change this to a switch. And what switch does is if it's one, it's going to be one thing. Uh, the, the top one. If it's zero, it's going to be the bottom one. Uh, however, you can input a mask to use the information from both. Just selectively. So we're going to use the edge detect thing that we have over here for that. Um, I just so high quality blur grayscale. Stick that in there. Uh, let's try and not lose that detail. So again, let's bump that up here. And let's just see how that looks if we plug that into the mask. Okay, so Uh, we've not really captured an awful lot there. It could be due to how this is blurred. If I invert this, will it be different? Okay, that's interesting because I'm essentially trying to change this bottom bit here. However, oh, of course, yeah, okay, yeah, I needed to set the mask back up to, uh, it actually wasn't doing anything because it was set to zero, so uh, my bad. Um, however, we're starting to kind of like, um, see what's happening here. So if I drop this, 
Yeah, so it is like somewhat blurring the edges a bit. However, it's I'm still going to keep tweaking it because I'm not completely satisfied. Okay, right, this is starting to get a bit closer to what I want. Yeah, so here we go. So we've really smoothed out this area here, which is great if you want to introduce things like grass into the gaps, because then it won't be strung up on this really huge gap. Um, but we can kind of control how much we want that to affect it. So we can drag this down a bit and, you know, use it sort of selectively. But I'm going to reduce this overall blur, I think. Fantastic. So now we've got these um, these nice kind of gradual drops into the crevices, but we've maintained the, the sharp edges of the top. So we've done that with a pretty simple masking technique. Now that's pretty much done. So we can drag this off to here, add a frame, give it a name just so you can find it so it's a lot easier. And um, so we're going back to this, and now this is where your style can really start to shine. Because um, I think, personally, that this is far too orderly, it doesn't look natural. Uh, so I'm going to use a bit of a warp node. And warp nodes are fantastic for working natural uh, looking shape into, or texture into the rocks, especially on edges. Now that looks disgusting, so let's um, drop that down to... So the scale of the warp isn't so great. And there's two parameters we're going to be fiddling with a lot here. And that's the size of the Perlin noise, which is really important for warp nodes. Because uh, as you'll see, it won't really work with something that's not blurry. So if I plug that in there, it's just going to look really horrible and like it's not really worked. But I'm sure if we blur it, it's going to be different. And it's going to work in like a lot better. So back to using Perlin noise. So... Those are too extreme, but it's about finding the right balance between the size of the waves, which you control with the Perlin noise, and also the intensity of the waves, which we can drop inside the warp node. <clears throat> now, I would already say, even though this effect is quite subtle, it's made a huge difference, and you can really play around with it and just, you know, decide what you think looks best. But I quite like that. It seems a bit more natural. Now, you don't want your rock to look kind of soft. And um, so I might increase the size of the waves. Just bring it down a bit. Yeah, because you don't want it to look like jelly, but you want it to, yeah, look natural. So the next simple thing we can do is a slope blur. Now this is almost uh, more of a texture thing. So whereas um, the warp affects the edges more, this is going to affect the surface texture. And again, Perlin noise is our best friend for driving these. So we're going to drop that down. In fact, no, keep it quite high. And um, now I want to make the samples quite high, so it's um, a greater resolution. I should probably be looking at this. Uh, but as you can see, it's kind of like flattening out areas. And if we really, really drop this intensity down, we're going to start to get back our forms. <coughs> there we go. So that is literally, it's not done a huge, anything massive, but it's just made it look a bit more natural, and a bit less flat, a bit more weathered, I suppose you could say. Um, which is another important thing that you'll probably notice with uh, rock faces. So, that's kind of a baseline right there, and you know, there's so much we can do with this already. You know, we could, um, in fact, why not? Is this going to work? Ha, <laughs> yeah, kind of works. And if like um, <clears throat> if we get sort of like bricks, let's just see some crazy stuff we can do with that. Leave that in there for now. Um, okay, I need to try and capture. Where's bricks one? So there's no option for random color, so we'll just use flood fill. Flood fill. Let's just get a random color. rather random grayscale. Oh no, I didn't get it. Nope, did it? Goodness me. Fourth time's a charm. <clears throat> so we've got that. Might use a distance node.
Which way round is it? There we go. And if we plug that into there... Yeah, there we go. We've got some bricks. You know, now, there's nothing wrong with that either. Uh, in fact, you could probably even get a levels node and just shave like the top part off it. Like that. And those look like some pretty decent bricks to me. You know, not bad at all. And it's all with the, just the same sort of techniques. Really, really easy. But we're going to go back to the stone. Now, you might want to stop there, but I'm going to look into having a bit more detail. Uh, you, specifically, things like cracks are quite important. So, let's use a really similar technique to what we used before. So, we're going to use cells. Uh, let's scale that up a bit. Use edge detect. Let's make the width quite low so it looks a bit more fractured. Now, what else could we do with this? Well, we could probably give a bit of variation in the height. So we could use the pearl and noise to lighten areas on the cracks, just to make it so they're you know, not as prominent in certain areas. And quite often what I'll do is um, stack them up. So I'll make another cracks, set of cracks. Maybe make them a fair bit smaller. Or larger. But we want it smaller. <clears throat> really, really drop the width. So it's absolutely tiny. And now we can actually... <coughs> oh, sorry. Um, we can actually, like, really selectively mask out parts of this. So, same technique as before, really. Uh, we're going to add these together. Starting with the top one... And we're going to darken. So there we go, they're kind of overlaid, but I think the small cracks are a bit overwhelming. So I'm going to make a purlin noise. We're going to create like a, a wacky mask with this. So let's just draw these values in really close. <coughs> and yeah, try to make an interesting mask with it. That's quite good. I might even warp it, <clears throat> just to give it a bit more unpredictability. That's quite good. And then we can use that as, um, similar to before, how we masked the two separate ones out. So look, we've only got small cracks in certain areas. <coughs> we can do that again when we actually work it into the final shape. So, blend again. Use this uh, mask that we made. Draw this out. Foreground. Just going to make that white. So there you go. It's not everywhere. So if we actually combine that with this. And say. Mm, let's, let's try darkening it. Um, ah, of course, wrong way around. So now we've got sort of like some, some cracks on here. But it's only really darkening the top peaks, which is a bit of an issue for me, because I quite like it all over it. And that's because darken isn't really going to do much to the already dark area, so we can try a different approach uh, by inverting this, and then instead choosing the subtract option. And that's a, you know, a bit more sort of consistent. So if we put this in here, uh, they're going to start to show up a bit more. Oh yeah, of course. We should probably change the um, random seed on that. We can make this less prominent again by using the levels node and just dropping the black value. And probably blurring it as well. Again, to make it so the cracks don't look so obvious and obviously grainy. Let's 
There we go. It's actually starting to have a bit more character to the surface, I suppose. It's looking a lot better. And something I quite like to do with stone, uh, this is why one of my techniques is actually adding like this weird broken layer effect. And we can do that again with a pearl and noise. Dropping that down. Uh, let's get a levels node and like really sort of shave the top and bottom off it. Because I don't like these really big um, peaks and like small peaks as well. Um, I quite like the it to be quite flattened at the top. So when we use our quantize node, it gives us this like really interesting layering effect. The more you quantize it, the more layers it has. There we go. It's quite interesting. Uh, but again, probably going to make this a little bit bigger. I'm going to try and get rid of some of these natural peaks. Um, but it, again, it looks too kind of like bubbly. And I've got a really interesting technique with the warp node. So if we plug both of the options into the warp node, it kind of like stretches it out. Um, which gives it like more of like this plateaued effect. Might not seem huge. But it makes it a bit more kind of like natural. And then we can even uh, make it less orderly by adding another warp, but instead of doing what we just did before, we can use a normal small pearl and noise to make it like kind of really chaotic and strange. Take the edge off it. <clears throat> and then it looks a bit more wild and interesting. Now, I tend to use this information here, so if we blend these together, I'm going to uh, maybe... Hmm. Yeah, multiply, I think, would be useful for this. And then we can add that detail onto the surface, like kind of this strange layered effect. But again, I don't want it everywhere, so I'm going to selectively mask bits of it off with this kind of crazy Perlin noise mask again. I'm going to make it slightly different, though. Instead of it being really, really harsh, I'm going to have it so it has a bit of a gradient to it. So that now when we apply it, maybe not so it's not too intense. Yeah, it's, it's added a bit more sort of like character and damage to the surface. And again, the bigger the forms you use, the more stylized it's going to look. Because this, um, you know, could have the danger of going into more realistic territory. Um, but yeah, I, I think it does need a bit of wear and tear on the surface. At least something to add a bit more intrigue. So we've got some pretty good shapes here. We could probably start looking into colour. Now, colour with stylized, my technique at least, is extremely, extremely simple and straightforward. I just get a gradient map. And if you've never used a gradient map before, it's a brilliant tool. You can, um, anywhere that's black on this spectrum is going to match the black areas in the gradient, and anything that's white is going to match the white. So if we change the black, it's going to make all the... If we could change that to red, it's going to make all the black areas red. And if we change this to green, it's going to make all the grey areas, like, green. Uh, which looks really weird like this, but we can use this um, to actually achieve some quite nice effects. So I'm going to make the crevices really dark brown. And then um, let's give it, like, this interesting kind of, like, dark grey stone. And I tend to make it a little bit lighter as I go up. But I don't want to add too much colour to it as well. And then generally finishing with the peaks being quite a, a light colour. Let's get it a little bit like sort of a peachier colour. Um, again, I think it's a little bit too saturated. But we can always add a bit more colour sort of in the mid-ranges like that. So it's just a lot of experimenting, deciding what you like. And then when you plug that into base colour, it's going to kind of like add it over the stones. And I think that's quite appealing on its own. Um, of course, there's a lot of different techniques you can use for this, uh, but that's one of them. And now we can really start playing around with some of the other parameters. So, you know, we can go back to scaling this up a bit, seeing how that looks. You know, that's really cool. Interesting, to say the least. But uh, I think some of the fascination comes in with the edge detect, so, like, you can massively ramp up the roundness. And, you know, that's going to give you some interesting space in between to add things like grass. 
which is really simple. Um, I won't show you exactly how I did that, but if we pop over to the other project, I created it all in substance. Um, I think it's at this top bit here. So yeah, I literally created like some leaves uh, with that bit there, spun them around with a splatter tool, and then used the tile sampler, which is an awesome tool, especially for surfaces, to kind of like imprint it in the, the middle areas. And if we come over here, and really mess with the edge detect options. Yeah, it can really, really overtake the material. In quite a nice way. So if we make this quite round. Yeah. And all this stuff can be modified in Engine as well. As long as you use the Substance plugin, you can import one material and pretty much make like 10 materials from it. It's absolutely fantastic. But that's pretty much the technique I would use for everything. Uh, so what we've covered is how to create the larger forms and then literally just working in smaller, smaller forms each time. So th these here were the cracks. So what you would do then is once you'd finished that, add a frame, you know, give it a name that's reasonable, easy to find. Oh my goodness. There we go. <laughs> so yeah. It's pretty simple, and you can also combine colors like we did uh, with the other sort of like height stuff here. And of course, you know, you can mess around with your metallic values. So quite often, if you want to create like a really wet looking material, I'll just increase that quite a lot. Of course, you have to drop the roughness. So it's like... Yeah, really, really simple. It looks like it's just been raining. And uh, there's so much you can do, but I'd usually modify things like that in Engine. But that's just like an overview of how I created those shapes. So start with large forms, work in smaller details as you go, use reference, and you should end up with something that's really simple, um, but yet really, really elegant. And we only really used in this material was like warp node, levels, blend, a little bit of flood fill, but it's pretty much the same nodes over and over again. So get really good with a few nodes if you want to produce good designer substances and... Um, you will find yourself creating really good things and quite often you might just try one new thing per project and it will help a lot. So thank you very much for watching. I hope that was helpful and uh, yeah, see you later.